Cool. Okay, um, so now I'd like to um, invite Dr. Hamish Avigor from Dow61, um, from the Confidential Computing Team, to um, give us a talk on a different um, approach to secure PPRL, faster encrypted PPRL using batch. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, first of all, uh, this is a, a work in progress. And I should probably also admit that the talk is a work in progress about the work in progress. So uh, it might get a little rough towards the end, but hopefully it should be okay. Um, so this work uh, comes motivated by, um, I guess, two things. Uh, one was the paper from the folks at the Center for Data Linkage um, that was mentioned earlier um, by Sean, that um, we that combined uh, homomorphic encryption with um, uh, with PPRL. And the other was an idea that I believe came up sometime last year in discussions with uh, Keith Young from Austrac about matching um, so sort of essentially records from different institutions um, uh, to provide a coherent view of their database. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, a way to, to do this kind of matching um, hopefully significantly faster than the previous, some of the previous work. Um, and uh, it's using a particular trick that I came across in a completely different context. And essentially my contribution is uh, marrying these two ideas and uh, reaping the benefits. Um, so the first step will be rephrasing the problem, essentially uh, to say that all, we were doing matrix multiplication the whole time. Uh, then I'll describe um, a batching technique uh, used in homomorphic encryption um, which uh, is part of what we're going to exploit. Um, then uh, sort of a, this not particularly well-known uh, form of matrix multiplication called systolic matrix multiplication, which kind of died in the, in the 90s with um, its original um, owner and until resurfacing. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, sorry, I should, have, <laughs> I should have rephrased that uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the research of its original owner uh, until fairly recently. And then I'll have a look at uh, whether I actually did improve anything. Um, <clears throat> okay, so nothing new on this slide. It is meant merely to um, point out that most of the, our similarity um, formulae are based around the inner product. Like the, the main calculation in each case is the inner product. Um, which one we use in some sense is, uh, I, I'm indifferent. Um, but the idea is that in each case, um, the same calculation is to be made, and it is something like the following. We uh, have uh, our two sets of filters. They, in some sense, I also don't really care if they're filters or not. They're, they're essentially binary vectors representing um, the, the two parties involved. And we want to calculate the similarity of the, essentially the cross-similarity matrix, which we call S. Um, <clears throat> and so because each of the similarities is based around this uh, so in a product calculation, essentially we're calculating the inner product of all the different pairs, which is literally just the definition of matrix multiplication. Um, and so I want to make that as fast as I can. Um, <clears throat> the privacy considerations we are now all abundantly aware of. Um, the clicks themselves don't um, protect as much as we would have liked. Um, even if you uh, have the whole similarity matrix, there is very good reason to believe that you can actually reconstruct the clicks to a large extent from the full similarity matrix. So uh, at the very least, some kind of thresholding should be used. Um, <clears throat> and these problems are partially mitigated by in just encrypting as much as you can. Uh, in this case, we'll be calculating the, the um, similarity matrix in encrypted space. Um, one thing I will not be able to do, at least not at this stage, is any thresholding um, I will only touch on that briefly. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to get into the protocols in depth because uh, partly I don't, uh, I haven't looked at them in depth, and uh, partly they are. I want to present them mainly to illustrate two ways in which we might do this multiplication. Um, the first uh, is in a, a. This is just an example and not published um, protocol or anything. So take this with a certain grain of salt. Um, but the idea is that we have two parties and they collaborate on creating the similarity matrix. And the important thing to note here is on uh, the left. Oh, so I'll describe this very briefly. So Alice um, will have uh, personally identifiable information uh, that she encrypts and sends to Bob. 
Bob does the matrix calculation, which notice um, Bob can achieve with uh, his own matrix in uh, plain text or in uh, sort of unencrypted. So we have an encrypted matrix multiplied by an unencrypted matrix. Um, then the rest of the protocol, I'll just describe briefly, but don't want to dwell on. Uh, Bob uh, randomly permutes the result, sends it back to Alice. Alice decrypts. Alice is the only holder of the secret key. Alice will decrypt, apply the thresholding, um, can't reconstruct, doesn't know which um, similarity scores correspond to her original data because of the random permutation. The thresholding, uh, thresholded matrix is sent back to Bob, who can then um, invert the, um, the permutation pi. Um, uh, so this was just, uh, came to me first by Wilco, um, and I saw in a blog post by Ki Siong uh, late last year that a similar idea without the permutations was, was presented. Um, on the other side, uh, we have the, um, the picture that we saw earlier um, from uh, our friends at Curtin, uh, where in this case the matrices will be encrypted on uh, both sides and sent to a linker who can't see any of the matrices in plain text. So in that case, uh, the multiplication will be from two encrypted matrices to produce the final encrypted product. Okay, so there are these two cases, encrypted matrix times plain matrix and encrypted matrix times encrypted matrix. Um, and we can do both. Um, <clears throat> this is gonna be a very quick introduction to homomorphic encryption, um, in particular, the ring learning with errors scheme. Um, I'm not going to go into almost any of the details. The main thing to remember from this slide is that the objects that we're dealing with uh, come from rings that look like this. They are polynomials. The coefficients are between zero and some number a, and they are bounded in degree by n. In fact, they will be they'll have um, degree n uh, n minus one. Um, <clears throat> the plain text space will be one of these polynomials, uh, the plain a plain text will be one of these polynomials. So notice that the size of one of these things is essentially n times uh, how many bits are in A. So that's how big a, one of these things will be. So the plain text space will be one, uh, an example of this ring. The ciphertext space is two such polynomials, but where the coefficients will be much bigger. Um, typical values. For example, uh, are given here, t about 16 bits, q about 110 bits, um, and the degree of the polynomial about 4,000. It's pretty standard these days. Uh, and those uh, parameters give ciphertext, which are about 110 kilobytes. And the important property of this system is precisely that given encrypted, um, encrypted values, so elements of the ciphertext space, there are operations that allow you to produce the encryption of the sum or product of those two values without decrypting uh, in the meantime. So I expect most of that to be at least vaguely familiar to, to most people. Um, <clears throat> so the next step is the Chinese remainder theorem, which uh, we are going to exploit in order to provide a more useful um, way of encoding vectors into the plain text space. So the plain text space was this ring of polynomials, and um, the Chinese remainder theorem is, is, uh, just says that when the quotient polynomial splits into some factors, in this case we're going to aim for a complete uh, splitting into linear factors, distinct linear factors, <coughs> in that case the plain text space is actually isomorphic to copies of um, polynomials modulo the factors, and that's just a fancy way of saying that it's actually, each of these is actually isomorphic to just the coefficients themselves. So in a nutshell, the Chinese remainder theorem says that the plain text space can be thought of as just a vector space with, uh, of, of n elements. You can forget all about the polynomials, you can forget all about these details, you can just treat it as a vector, and that's convenient because we're dealing with vectors of bits. Okay, so we're going to put our vectors of bits into the right-hand end of that and then use this isomorphism to move between these two representations. Um, the isomorphism aspect, okay, so we know, you've probably heard homomorphic as a word more frequently than isomorphic, but the isomorphism is 
ism, homomorphism, which just guarantees a perfect correspondence. So this isomorphism guarantees that uh, if I multiply two elements of the plain text space, that will correspond to a multiplication on the right-hand side, which itself is just component-wise multiplication, which is what we want when we're doing, say, um, dot product. Okay. Uh, the question is, x to the n plus one, when will it split? Uh, hang on. So, okay. So I covered. Sorry, that was the next slide. Um, <clears throat> So I covered this briefly when I was uh, talking just then, but the round trip will look something like, we start with a bit vector. It is, in some sense, very obviously a vector in this space because this is zt to the n is the same as the bit uh, vectors, but with more space in the coefficients. I apply the Chinese remainder theorem. In this case, I've got an inverse here, but that's just an artifact of the order of the, um, the domain and codomain as I wrote it on the previous slide. Just ignore it. So apply the Chinese remainder theorem, I get a plain text. I encrypt the plain text. I operate on the, uh, this cipher text with uh, addition and multiplication. Decrypt, get another plain text. Apply the Chinese remainder theorem again. Get a vector in uh, this um, uh, isomorphic uh, space. And then that gives me my bit vector. Um, this is a parenthetical. Please feel free to have a break if you, um, if you feel like it. Um, but for anyone who's interested, the way that we get the uh, polynomial to split is that um, <clears throat> we observe that the polynomial, the, uh, the modulus, polynomial modulus appears, um, or it can be written in this, fact, in this way. So this is just difference of two squares. Um, so we see that we've got x to the 2n minus 1 equals um, something else times the polynomial that we're interested in. Um, and so the idea is that we pick uh, the, this t, which is part of the plain text space, we pick that so that um, this x to the 2n minus 1 splits completely. Um, and the reason why we've done that is because we actually know precisely the condition on t to, to guarantee that. The condition is that um, 2n must divide t minus 1. And that, in um, nerd speak, just means that the, the uh, if T is prime, then we get a field, and then the multiplicative group of that field will have, if it has a, for any divisor of the, the order of that group, uh, will have a, an element of that order. And so that element will precisely iterate through the roots of the polynomial. So we basically just find one of the roots using this trick, and we multiply them, multiply it with itself, and that will just enumerate all the, the roots. And then it's easy to check which of those roots correspond to the second factor, because you just substitute them in and See if you get zero. Okay, so <clears throat> that provides a restriction on the choice of t, which can be annoying, but um, uh, that is relatively minor restriction. Okay, this is a second parenthetical, which is that um, I said before the um, plain text are uh, elements of a polynomial ring, um, but the the fact of um, the fact of the way that T is chosen means that there is some extra structure going on. Um, and that basically means that we have two mechanisms by which to, um, to move the slots of the plain text around. Um, <laughs> so, you prank them. Um, so, so I'm going to represent by this spiral operations of this kind. There are two operations. One is just flipping so imagine that this, the, uh, the elements of my plain text, I've just written them, I've divided them in half and put one half under the other half. That's the, the two sides here. So there's a way to flip, uh, to exchange the top and bottom. And there's another way to move all of the rows uh, in a cyclic manner. Okay, we don't need to know anything about that, but I do need to draw that spiral a bit later, which is the only reason why I've really got this slide in here. Um, basically, you can ignore that to a large extent. It's just going to be a like a technical uh, need later on. Okay, so now onto the actual <laughs> content, finally. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to look at three ways of, um, of performing this multiplication, uh, and the last of which is, uh, is my contribution. Um, the first is to look at what the obvious thing to do might be. So <clears throat> let's see what's going on here. So we've got, we're going to split the matrix multiplication problem 
into essentially a sequence of vector times matrix, which makes sense, like the, this linear. Um, in this case, the left-hand party, or the color, I'm going to call them color party and gray party. So the color party, we've got rows are our, um, our filters, or binary vectors. So the color corresponds to a binary vector, and then the shade just gives you a different bit of the, of the binary vector. In fact, even, I don't really even care if they're binary, to be honest, most of the time. So, <clears throat> so the multiplication, will, we're doing, obviously, standard multiplication. So we've got um, each row of the matrix times the column, uh, which corresponds to, we get four groups in this case. The multiplication, remember, so these are the plain text representations of the ciphertext. Uh, the multiplication will mean that these multipl multiplications happen component-wise. Uh, then there's a bit of magic, which very happily um, as Marcel touched on before, because this addition and rotation stuff is actually the tree addition folding thing that you got from Hackers Delight. It's pretty, I mean, it's relatively straightforward, but yeah, so there's basically a logarithmic number of additions and rotations there. Uh, and after you do that, you end up with the resulting dot product in each location of the, of the, um, of the plain text vector. So you need to do that for each. Um, each row of the matrix, and that means that we, so what does that look like? If we have n bloom, so at the moment I'm assuming actually that the number of entities on uh, the color side and the gray side are actually the same. That's not necessary at all, uh, as long as the, the number is sort of coherent, but um, uh, I'm just assuming that they're the same because I think that's a pretty common case and it makes everything square, which makes the diagrams look nicer. Um, so assuming we have M blue, blue filters on each side, um, uh, so M bits in a bloom filter and N is the same N as before. So the color matrix will have N ciphertexts, one for each bloom filter, the gray matrix the same, the number of multiplications is N squared. Uh, we can ignore this. This is the, the rotations and um, tree addition thing. Um, and then the similarity matrix will involve n squared ciphertexts because we only got one dot product for every, um, for every multiplication. So that should be completely unsurprising, uh, ignoring the rotations. <clears throat> what does that look like in practice? Uh, very quickly, basically, the size of the matrices will, like, these are the same. Um, security parameters that I listed earlier, and I've picked uh, capital N to be 2048, because that actually happens to be a nice uh, um, size for those security parameters in what I'm going to talk about later. Um, <clears throat> ciphertext size I already mentioned earlier, the matrices will be about 220 megabytes, we've got about 4.2 uh, million ciphertext multiplications, and the resulting similarity matrix is gigantic. Um, so next attempt, and this is essentially the, how the, um, the folks at Curtin uh, did it, uh, based on a, a trick by Yasuda. Um, <clears throat> the only difference here is, so the first, first thing I should mention, this trick does not involve any Chinese remainder theorem or, um, or any tricky packing. It's actually just putting the coefficients of your vector in front of the, sorry, putting the elements of your vector as the coefficients of the plain text polynomial. Um, the trick is basically just to reverse one of, the, um, one of these polynomials. And then, of course, the dot product occurs as one of the coefficients of the product of those poly polynomials just by the definition of polynomial multiplication. So the upshot is when you do these multiplications, the component wise, this is now a multiplication of two polynomials um, rather than component wise. I apologize for the. Um, ambiguous uh, diagram, but uh, the end result is that the dot product will end up in one of the locations of the resulting ciphertext rather than all of the um, locations. But the advantage here is that we don't need to do the rotation and addition thing. And it turns out the rotations are somewhat expensive. So um, that is an improvement. Um, so this is essentially the same as before. Um, but uh, there are zero rotations, and so all of these are the same as the first one. All of these are the same as the first one, except for uh, the rotations, which is zero. Okay. This is uh, what you all came here to see. Um, so 
we want to so we want to do two things. We want to so, so both the previous examples that I talked about did so were um, lacking in two ways. First of all, only one bloom filter per cipher text. Uh, bloom filters maybe 512, 1024 bits, something like that. Cipher text almost always going to have at least 2048 um, spaces, usually 4096, as I wrote. So there's a lot of wasted space there. So the first thing I want to do is pack several bloom filters into the same cipher text. Um, which I can do much more easily with the um, Chinese remainder theorem encoding. The second thing I want to do is I want to make sure that I get one dot product per slot in the output ciphertext. And so that way I don't get 440 gigabytes um, uh, output matrices, I get uh, like a tiny fraction of that. Um, okay, so how do we do that? Um, it's a bit of a trick. Um, this hot mess is actually derived from the previous matrix. So instead of having so I had a red row, a green row, a blue row, and a purple row. I've first of all taken the transpose. So red row was up the top, now it's a column. And for each subsequent row, I've shifted up one slot. So red row is the same. Green row, I went up by one, so the dark green ends up at the bottom. Blue row, up by two, so the dark blue is down here. Purple row, up by three. Is that all clear? So. That's a little bit magical, but in some sense, uh, it kind of, um, the benefits become obvious. Uh, in some sense, it's almost, you, it comes out when you're trying to retrofit based on the, con the constraints that I just described, because now uh, what's happened? Oh, so there's an, sorry, there's an extra element. Um, now we do the same crosswise multiplication as before. So this is, these are um, Chinese remainder theorem packed vectors. So we're multiplying component wise. Um, but now, notice the columns. So these are, this is still a cipher text. So we've got, we're mixing a single, a whole bunch of different bloom filter elements in the same cipher text. So the cipher text are rows. But here, look at the columns. The red thing happens in separate cipher texts. Green happens in separate cipher texts, blue and the purple. So that means that when I add them all up, um, I end up with a dot product in each ciphertext. And the reason why that happens is because in, there's this extra stage where I've got, I'm actually rotating the right-hand side vector by one element each time I multiply as well. Okay, so it's component-wise multiplication, then I, uh, I have my gray vector and I've shifted it um, to the left, and so the dark gray ended up on the right-hand side uh, so that the, um, the shades correspond again. And then I do the same. So this is sort of shifting along in the same way that I've rotated the, sorry, this is rotating, not shifting, rotating in the same way that the columns of the, this matrix were rotated. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and by doing that, we, we've essentially decoupled the terms of the dot product from the ciphertexts. Okay. That was the problem with the two previous cases in some sense, that all of the terms of the dot product ended up in the same ciphertext so you had to add up all of the different components within a ciphertext, and that's really awkward. So uh, we don't do that. We decouple them so that this is the first term of the, the gray, black, uh, sorry, the gray, red um, dot product. This is the second term, third term, fourth term. And then when you, you can add them up, and it appears in the first element of the output type. going 25 minutes. Ugh. Right. Um, okay. So I skipped over a couple of details in the, the colorful image. Um, based on the, the slightly funny um, hacking, but the actual um, complexity or, or sizes are as follows. So the color matrix, we have saved approximately M divided by N in size, um, <clears throat> which is in accordance with fitting uh, M, um, sorry, if I don't know what it is. Yeah, that's right. So I've got, I can fit um, M over N bloom filters in each ciphertext. So this is a, uh, this is less than one, M over N. Um, the gray matrix, this divided by two is actually a consequence of that thing I told you not to pay attention to before. So let's not look for that too closely. Um, <clears throat> the number of ciphertext multiplications, uh, we essentially get uh, the same n squared, which is essentially, which is quite difficult to get rid of, but we've saved this um, this factor, this linear factor, um, 
Uh, we've, we've introduced some rotations, which is not ideal, but um, can't do much about that. And the similarity matrix is now linear in the number of bloom filters. Uh, and it's better than linear, like it's um, half of the number of bloom filters is the number of ciphertexts. So in real terms, uh, same conditions as before. Um, color matrix is now down from 220 megabytes is about 27, 28. Uh, the other side, you can't, we're not encoding the matrices in a symmetric way, so we've saved about half the space in the, the gray matrix, so it's 110, still not bad. Um, 0 0.5 million multiplications, because we're saving a lot in the, um, in, in, due to the packing. So this is a saving due to essentially the factor of M over N. Has some rotations to consider. The similarity matrix is 110 megabytes, which is better than 440 gigabytes. Um, <clears throat> when I implemented this, uh, this is what happened. So the same factors again. I'm just computing the dot products. I confess I didn't compute the whole dice coefficient because that might involve like three dot products, depending on how you do it. Uh, I just calculated the dot products, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, eight minutes for um, encrypted times plain. Uh, 47 for plain times encrypted, so that's admitting the, um, essentially this is the cost of the rotations. And 90 minutes for encrypted times encrypted, so this is N is 2,000, so this is about 4 million uh, comparisons. Encryption, 1.7 seconds, because of the packing, we've saved a, a huge proportion there. Decryption, 0 0.6 seconds, uh, because uh, there's just, there's, uh, yeah, there's only 110 I bet. <laughs> we all need a rest sometimes. Um, okay, uh, so I'm going to attempt to make a comparison with um, the, the curtain work, which is made difficult by a few factors. Um, so the reported uh, time in um, the Center for Data Linkage work is considerably longer, but uh, it needs to be understood correctly. So they quoted 33 hours for the entire process for which um, I, I, I think it's, I miss, uh, oh yeah, I wanted to just make a quick comment about, so that obviously this should be like linear, perfect linear speed up. Um, uh, an area for investigation is when I, add through 10 cores of this problem, it only sped up by five, a factor of five, whereas it should speed up by a factor of 10. So uh, that's a lesson for me to learn how to do C++ multi-threaded programming better. Um, so remind me about that. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to get through this a bit quickly. But um, so, in summary, the um, the curtains work, which is like very valuable because it was one of the first pieces of work in this area. Um, but they were held up by a fact by the fact that the cryptographic primitives were um, ve very slow compared to certainly what we have now. Um, I've kind of combined two improvements in one by measuring their reported uh, crypto primitive speeds with uh, what I measured for my own, keeping in mind that we have different security parameters. Their security parameters like N is 1024, I think uh, Q was like 54 bits instead of 500, uh, instead of 110, things like this. So overall, um, there's a slower by a factor of about 10 to mine. So if we take that into consideration, let's say that it took about 3.3 hours. Um, I think that's probably fairly fair. Um, so, and also, on the other hand, uh, they only did those times are for 1,000 by 1,000. So there's a million comparisons, whereas mine for were 4 million comparisons. So I'm going to divide mine by 4. That means I took 23 minutes in total um, with these numbers here. Um, and so I improved by a factor of about 8.6, which actually corresponds roughly to M over N. Like it's about an eight-fold improvement, which is precisely how many bloom filters I fit into um, a ciphertext. Uh, I, I hope that's the reason why I got those numbers. Um, <coughs> I mean, who knows? Um, so, just to finish up, I have some ideas for making my stuff even faster. Um, first of all, I, I mean, this is almost the dumbest thing, but like I didn't even try to, I, I knew that in some sense I should be able to have smaller security parameters which would uh, make my crypto primitives, even, uh, like the crypto operations even faster, but um, I didn't even try to optimize that. Um, did pretty well in spite of that. Um, there are lots of literature on fancy matrix multiplication algorithms that might reduce the number of ciphertext multiplications. Um, that deserves um, investigation. 
Uh, there's a trick called hoisting, which uh, is used in speeding up when you have to do a whole bunch of rotations on the same uh, plain text. You can actually amortize a large part of that cost. So that could actually mean a huge proportion of the rotation cost is actually just eliminate, eliminate, <laughs> eliminated. Um, there's compression techniques, like I said. I don't really care if the bloom filters are bits or like bigger numbers. There's a lot of space for ex um, exploiting compression, compressing the, um, the bloom filters. There's also a thing called a two-dimensional uh, Chinese remainder theorem, which I'm suspicious probably, I suspect probably won't help, but um, in principle, you can actually, you could actually put an entire bloom filter in each slot of the plain text rather than having the bits of the bloom filter spread across the slots of the plain text. Um, and another idea, which is sort of fits into the second category here, is like maybe if I rearrange the gray matrix in a, in a different way, maybe I could sort of um, avoid some of the rotations ahead of time. I think that's almost certainly not going to work, but um, it would be remiss not to try. Thank you.